Next talk now, I'm delighted to welcome um, Dr. Catherine Farrell from Trinity, and you're going to talk to us about nature-based solutions and peatlands. So thanks, Catherine. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, I feel I, I might have... Um, well, I know I'm going to give a different sort of style of um, message this morning. And um, when I was asked to deliver this, obviously, I jumped at the chance because uh, I love Mayo and I wish I was down there. Um, my own background is I've been working on, on peatlands. So I, I did my initial research down in Bella Corrig. So I, when I was finishing up my degree, suddenly there was a, an ad that said that we need somebody to restore peatlands in Mayo. And I thought that's about as exotic as I can get coming from the Midlands. And then I spent about 20 years on and off working with the people, uh, the lads from Belmullet and Cross Malina. And I sort of, I remember the flooding in Cross Malina. I, 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 I keep track of what's happening there. So I'm really, uh, really interested in in how how you're going to tackle some of these challenges in terms of uh, climate adaptation and I suppose given my interest in peatlands I'm going to present to you some ideas um, around that and I'm probably less like Phelan and Eris it's more to understand maybe what peatlands are the sorts of things that they do when they're healthy and um, how we can work with them. So I've less sort of hands-on approaches, but I feel that the solutions are already met and they're quite simple in terms of blocking drains. And I think to Phelan's point, it's about how you plan that. And uh, Phelan's last slide there, which showed the different catchments that really you need to start uh, being strategic about drain blocking and um, all that but anyway that'll all come out in the wash as I sort of ramble through my presentation on peatland so my first question is can we see that and can we see my slides your slides are up you just need to go to full yeah. screen yep yeah, your full screen perfect is that good? yeah yep. so uh, as um I, I was introduced as a, a research fellow in Trinity so just for the last couple of years I, I left Board Mona which was uh, where I really learned my train trade in terms of uh, peatland restoration and I'm working uh, with uh, Iris uh, in in the School of Natural Sciences and really it's about at the moment I'm trying to bring together a lot of the learnings um, in terms of natural capital accounting so trying to join up the dots in in terms of how we track the effects of restoration and how we can combine policy and real life action. So that's sort of in a nutshell where I am at the moment. So as I say, I'll get cracking. What are peatlands? Uh, where do we find them? What do we use them for? What kind of state are they in and the future? So this is really just to contextualize our discussions and maybe some of your thoughts in developing a strategy for peatlands in, in County Mayo. So what are peatlands? So uh, we have lots of different types of peatlands in Ireland and indeed we really are a hot spot for peatlands. This entire country has got raised bogs, it's got extensive fens, uh, it would have had more extensive fens and uh, it will when the border mona lands come out of peat production a lot of those will actually revert to fens. So fens were, are really those things that you found thousands of years ago as the at they were the precursors of the bogs and we still have a few sites uh, that are really important like Pollardstown Fen uh, in County Kildare but just to say that there are some really highly valuable fens and flushes uh, within the Blanca bog complexes in Mayo and and this these flushes are are really up where upwellings of, of mineral water um, you know, meet the ambrotrophic surroundings and some of the rarest plants are in Ireland are occurring in these flushes. So Mayo has a real, uh, really important role in terms of um, holding these sort of natural museums, um, natural, natural history museums. So fens and flushes are really uh, interesting and a unique feature in the blank bogs in Mayo. 
And then flashing forward to the other types of peatlands that we have in Ireland, which are the, the bogs. And so this is what some of you might be looking out the window at. So this photograph on the top left was taken overlooking Lake Caramore. And you can see uh, Drummanaphron Hill, I think, in the background. So you can see how the bogs are really spread right out across the landscape. And I, that was a really interesting statistic. Um, that Emma presented that 38% of the land is covered uh, with peatlands in Mayo. And I would say it's actually higher than that. I would say that the original extent of peatlands was probably higher and quite a significant area has now been converted into either forestry or agricultural land. So um, also in East Mayo, you would get some really nice examples of raised bogs. And, you know, these, these also are important within the landscape and provide, you know, lots of those services that both Phelan and Iris were talking about in terms of uh, flood mitigation and uh, filtering water. And like I, 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 I really feel an understanding of how the landscape is important for us to understand, you know, the, the, the benefits that we can get back by actually restoring these sites. So it's the restoration of the peatlands that are, are the key nature-based solution here that I'm presenting this morning. And the nature-based solutions revolve really about aligning these elements of the peatlands, which are the water, the peat, and the biodiversity, the biodiversity being the plants, the plants, primarily the plants that form them and work to create that skin and to create the, the carbon sink component, but then also the animals uh, which we might uh, have working uh, for us on top of them uh, in terms of when we use peatlands for grazing and, and other things. So to, to understand them better, it's, it's this triage of water, peat and biodiversity. So they do so much for us when they're healthy. Okay, so just to reinforce those messages, you know, fail and present about water quality, and even a small peatland, even a small fen, even a small wetland, as, as Phelan showed us, can really help to provide those focal points for the entry points of the phosphorus into the rivers or the, the nitrogen. So they really work to help, um, you know, provide good water quality. They store water. And, and I suppose, you know, in Mayo, with that extent of peatland, and let's, as we get further into this presentation, I'm going to highlight that a lot of the peatlands that we have in Mayo are actually drained. So by working with them, we can help to slow down the movement of water from the top of the catchment right down from the source to the sea. And that can really help in terms of flood regulation. And, and then working with the coastal wetlands, as Iris outlined, they work, they all work together. These systems work together and worked, worked really well together until we, 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 we sort of um, started experimenting with them. So, and the water flow, so the regulation of flow, either for drinking water, for animals, you know, they're really important as well. Um, the peat itself is, you know, we're talking about climate this morning I and mean, climate is caused by, you know, the release of greenhouse gases. Um, climate change is caused by the elevated release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. But the carbon stock in our peatlands, you know, peatlands cover about 3% of the land surface, but store double amount carbon in all forests. So that's a really important message. So, you know, I sort of reinforce this message because often people, well, you know, the message is we need to plant trees, you know, and that might be fine where you're in a sort of a dry land scenario in around um, Italy and the Mediterranean. But in Ireland, we really need to work with our wetlands and maybe not plant trees on the wetlands, because by by doing that, we're actually leading to the release of this massive carbon store and not allowing the peatlands do what they should be doing. So peatlands are just absolute superheroes in terms of climate uh, regulation. And we want to keep that carbon in the ground. So we need to work with the peatland um, to, do, to do that effectively. And then of course, from the 
the biodiversity or the, the indicators of really healthy peatlands that they're up and running are these more vulnerable species like red grouse, hen harrier and curlew, which is um, on, on the decline. And of course, in Mayo, you have the, the beautiful golden plover and the, the Nathan uh, Park, Ballycroy National Park is just a, a real stronghold for those there along with red grouse. So you have it all in Mayo. And I think it's really just about making sure we look after them when we work with them. Um, just to put it in perspective, again, I wasn't sure what the audience knew about peatlands in general, but I suppose we have peatlands right across Ireland. And this map from our friend and colleague, John Connolly shows the, the blue, that's really the lowland blanket box. So that's the kind of stuff that you see looking out from cage of fields and looking right, right out across Knock Moyle and Cheskin Reserve and down into Connemara. And then the green, the greener areas are those uh, more upland peatland. So really in Mayo, you can see you have that density right out on the Eris uh, Peninsula, but equally when, as we move back into East Mayo that you start to see the role of those, the red being the raised bogs and uh, the yellow here being the Borgamona sites, uh, which uh, I would be very familiar with. Um, and, and then of course, just to reinforce the role that we play. So if Mayo is a hotspot, uh, Ireland is also a hotspot for peatlands. And this is a map of showing essentially the darker, the, the coloring here that, that you're a hotspot. So we're up there alongside uh, Indonesia and Canada and Finland in terms of the importance of peatlands. And I would say equally here in the Congo Basin in Africa. So, you know, we're, we're with, um, you know, a good gang of people who are working to try and reverse some of our mistakes in the past in terms of degradation and drainage of peatlands. And just some examples, just because it's Friday and it's nice to see things from around the world that we have these beautiful peatlands in Canada, very different. They actually have trees on their peatlands. Um, Finland, you can see an example here where a peatland was drained and they're now starting to to block up the drains. So the drainage in Finland is largely to try and extend forestry onto the sites, but they're, they're learning now we need to actually block up the drains and get the peatland back to where it should be. Of course, in, in Indonesia and uh, Malaysia, just absolute hotspots uh, for peatlands. And, you know, not something, not a place you might think you were heading out on the bog and you needed <laughs> to be bringing your wellies, but absolutely covered in peatlands of a different nature, more tropical swamp and under pressure in their own right. Uh, Catherine, this, just, sorry, just a two minute warning there. Yeah, so, uh, so right across the world. So um, all of these slides will be available uh, to you guys. And just to highlight that as we use peatlands, we reverse some of these, you know, key characteristics that um, provide all those wonderful services for us. So, you know, we've, we've essentially used most either for conversion to agriculture, forestry, industrial extraction, and now more renewables. And I suppose just a snapshot of those uses um, within the landscape, um, you know, so when we talk about nature-based solutions in regards to peatlands, it's about how do we, how do we work with these used areas in order to bring back those services that we talked about, things like um, water quality and flood mitigation and climate regulation. So a lot of the times it can be just to remove the trees. So in this situation, you would be talking about clear felling and blocking drains. In the Bordemone examples, you'd be talking about blocking the drains here and allowing natural revegetation. And in these situations here, you can see that the issue here is it's not so much about drainage, but it's actually about having too many animals uh, grazing on these lands. So the, the solution here would essentially be to reduce the, the stocking levels. So lots of different solutions. Every, every peatland is different. And I suppose the key thing is um, understanding how they work, first of all, so that then we can tackle any of the obvious uh, degradations and, and issues there. And this peatland here being one that's 
working really well. You can see the water level right up at the surface. This is from Knockmoyle Sheskin uh, Reserve, which is uh, a fantastic spot in Mayo. Um, I'll close off there because I feel we should leave more time for discussions. Um, this is a shot taken from the top of Minan, and it just highlights that, you know, within this landscape, we, we, we can see forestry here. Um, so forestry creates its own issues. And again, how do we how do we work to reverse some of the effects of that? It's to clear fell and to block the drains. We also have some overgrazing here. Uh, so this would be uh, taken from the furnace in around Loch Furnace there uh, in the background. So but it's about working with the stocking levels and working with the farmers. So really working with the communities in the area. Uh, in terms of infrastructure, just showing that people have always lived within peatland landscapes, and this is a trackway uh, from a midlands bog, but we're still aligning our infrastructure through peatlands. And if it's not infrastructure roads, it might be infrastructure for power lines. So it's about working with the peatland um, to you know, have the least impact on the site. Um, we have ongoing turf cutting and you can see the turf banks all across uh, Ako here. And uh, so that's actually, you know, a, a really good opportunity for us to actually get in when these turf banks are, you know, finished because these, these cutover areas can actually be really good for regeneration of sphagnum and regeneration of the, of the peat mosses is where we want to get the carbon sucked back into the ground and of course we have our woolly woolly friend here so it's about controlling the level of the grazing so um in a nutshell peatlands huge opportunities to work with them uh, to and the nature-based solution is really about understanding the peatlands so therefore we can come with our management practices whether that's to block drains, whether, whether it's to reduce the grazing intensity, or whether it's to be more mindful when we're actually putting infrastructural developments through um, the peatland areas. So I'm, I'll stop sharing there and looking forward to our discussions. Thank you. <laughs>